So good afternoon. I think uh, we are ready to continue this afternoon session. And uh, all, all we know that uh, this afternoon we are under the umbrella of this idea of the third mission. And, uh, and uh, usually we tend to look a lot uh, on the third mission uh, by the perspective that we discussed previously, the com commercialization of the academic uh, research. But now, fortunately, we are going to move in other, in other aspects of the third mission. I think, the, uh, for me, even most important, uh, did not involve so many money, but uh, is surely uh, the most important. And uh, uh, this idea of a culture and science for all is a thing that uh, at university level we, we need to improve. And uh, surely we, are, we need to improve these uh, bridges between uh, uh, scientific culture and artistic culture. Uh, and uh, it's what we are going to try to, to talk uh, about. And um, I want to thank uh, the invitation, particularly to Professor Pedro Teixeira, and I think uh, he invite me because he knows that I try to keep my artistic activities together with the, the academic ones, and um, it's a pleasure to be here to discuss uh, uh, also these things. So we are going to, to have uh, two speakers, two invited speakers, and thank you for accepting the invitation. And um, uh, first of all, the Professor Nuno Ferran de Almeida. You are playing at home. <laughs> you are full professor yet at the Faculty of Sciences, and uh, uh, Professor Nuno Ferrand Almeida is director uh, of the director of the research network in biodiversity and evolutionary biology, and scientific coordinator of the researchers the research center in biodiversity and genetic resources. Um, he has, of course, also many other things and a, <laughs> a great curriculum, uh, but today uh, is going to try to discuss with us this, this idea of the, the, the revolution of the biolog biologic sciences and uh, putting the genomics in the heart of this revolution. Um, and uh, uh, also, I think, uh, is going to give us some, uh, some ideas of possible solutions related to the public understanding, understanding of science. Uh, the other invited speaker is uh, Professor Carlos Fiolais, and uh, he is full professor of the Department of Physics at the University of Coimbra. Um, professor Carlos Fiolais is also the director of the Center for Compute, uh, Compute, uh, Computational Physics. Um, and uh, you have a lot of experience and, uh, on uh, knowledge and, and the area of uh, transfer knowledge uh, related with, uh, with some centers of uh, Ciencia Viva in Coimbra and, uh, and also uh, on the Francisco Manuel dos Santos Foundation. And uh, the proposal of uh, Professor Carlos Fiolais for uh, today is also to uh, improve this idea of the, br the, the bridges of, uh, of the science and uh, particularly lit literature. Um, so, uh, and after we are going to have our colleagues and uh, I'm, I'm going to speak about them <laughs> uh, after. So we are going to start with uh, Professor Nuno. The floor is yours, is yours. thank you. Okay. First of all, I'd like to um, thank the organizers for this uh, meeting, um, who have invited, invited me to come here today. Um, and uh, a, a very special event of this is of course, for Professor Sebastian Feibus Gued. And I will try um, to give my very personal view of uh, the bridge that we need to science, in very uh, particular between biology and um, culture and uh, dissemination of, of science. So um, I'm, I'm a biologist, I'm evo an evolutionary biologist, I'm very much um, a natural histo historian, first of all. Um, I very much love this, this painter of all of you know, Paul Gauguin, uh, this, one, this particular one in the Museum of Fine Arts in, in, in Boston. 
in the period uh, where uh, Gauguin. Okay, in a period where Gauguin also, um, at the end of his life, uh, interrogated himself about the destiny of the planet the, um, and um, the destiny of the, 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 the human uh, species. So um, I will talk about uh, the foundations and the very brief history of biology and about nature and diversity of life. Um, and of course, I'm um, someone that is absolutely fascinated by the diversity, by the exuberance of the natural uh, world. I've been working uh, in this for more than 40 years now. And um, this, this, this diversity and the curiosity of humans for the diversity of, 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 of um, the nature um, started to become something coherent uh, with uh, the emergence of what we call now museums of natural history. They were first um, uh, other things. People were starting to collect all sorts of different uh, stuff that uh, was coming uh, from all uh, parts of the world after the Renaissance. But then museums of natural history become to, uh, to start to organize all this diversity and all this exuberance. And of course, our understanding of life um, um, started uh, seriously uh, from the work of uh, Charles Darwin on the origin of species. You can have here one of the, my most favorite kitsch covers of the origin of species, a Portuguese edition by uh, Lelo, and the single figure of the um, of, the, of that book that we all uh, know today that laid the foundations of um, evolutionary biology and of, of biology. Of course, um, and going this um, very, very, in a very, very quick way, um, we all know um, Watson and Crick describing um, the structure of uh, DNA, which is a universal homology and started the molecular era in the mid of the 20th century. And so today, um, since the, the very beginning of this century, that we since the beginning of so of, of the establishment of the human genome, uh, 16 years ago, marked what we can call the age of genomics. We are today uh, in a unique uh, age in science, in a unique age in biology, which is uh, the age of genomics, and this will completely change, as we know, as I will try to show you uh, our planet and our biosphere. But today with this, all the, these techniques um, that we have in molecular labs, uh, in molecular biology labs, we can do very amazing things. For example, we can go back to Darwin's work in the Galapagos and we can use genomics to do the full genome sequencing of all Darwin finches, including the very, the very individuals that were collected by, their, by Darwin himself and built an evolutionary tree that explains diversity among those finches. At this scale, or at any other scale, for example, we can zoom out and just uh, build the tree of life. And so we have a much better understanding of what, what life is and what is the tree of life just because of using genomics uh, today in molecular biology labs in our universities. But we can zoom in and we can, for example, follow the very fast evolution of HIV virus in a single individual for a very short period. And this, of course, uh, offer us a unique understanding of um, those virus and how we can um, deal with, uh, with, with, with them. Um, of course, we will, we, today with genomics, we, we, we may understand nature in a more, in a unique way. For example, here, um, we recognize those very uh, um, famous British mosses that changed the frequency of the color after industrial revolution. Uh, this is a unique experiment in biology. It is a unique experiment in evolutionary biology, as the British uh, geneticist Ford just described um, very, very well and so emphatically. The thing is that that example is known for almost 200 years, but we understood the molecular basis of these changes only this year, in May, this year, 
this was the cover of the New York Times, and just describing that the very simple single gene that is responsible for such a change, such an extraordinary change, showing how natural populations can adapt to very quick uh, changes in the environment, were just discovered um, uh, this year uh, and published uh, in Nature, of course. So we have an extraordinary tool to understand uh, nature at unprecedented uh, levels um, as never before. So as we understand nature and we, as, as we understand variation in the natural world, we also understand much better what we are doing to nature. So we understand, we understand now today much better what domestication is. For example, we know that all the huge diversity of dog breeds, we have more than 400 different dog breeds, all was selected and came from a single species, which is the wolf. So all this diversity in size, in shape, in personality, in behavior, just came from the wolf and was selected in a very, very small lapse of time, just a little bit more than 10,000 years. This is rather extraordinary. And we know all this because we are sequencing the full genome of uh, all dogs and many wolves all around the world. But if this was our first domesticate and our best friend, our last is, for me, the most extraordinary, which is a rabbit, the European rabbit. The European rabbit gave rise to uh, more than 200 different rabbit breeds. And this is really extraordinary. Why? Because the European rabbit, as you know, is the more formidable machine, alert machine because more than 40 different predators can feed, can eat this real, real ideal prey. It's an ideal prey in, in our fields. It's a, it's a moving target of one kilogram of meat. So it's the perfect prey for eagles, for lynxes, for wolves, for foxes, for everything. So it's extraordinary how the European rabbit developed a series of special senses to detect predators. But now look into what is a domestic rabbit. In 500 years, in 500 generations, a domestic rabbit is a completely different animal. A completely different animal in many senses. For example, it's, it is much better in reproduction. It rep reproduces much better than the wild rabbit. It's much better uh, in um, size, much bigger but it's much worse in understanding the world. There is a strong decline of environmental appreciation by domestic rabbits when compared to wild rabbits. They lost their ability to understand what a predator is, for example. And so if I will show a wolf or a fox to this guy, he will not understand it and he will stay just looking till he will die in the second after. So we know why. We, starting, we are starting to know why, and this is extremely interesting. So this was a paper that a highly talented uh, guy in my lab, Miguel Carneiro, just published um, two years ago in Science, showing um, that we are now understanding what is domestication, and domestication is this change because we have been modif modifying the um, expression of brain function genes. So we are now mapping exactly what are the genes that were uh, amenable to us to modify genetic diversity in natural populations. So um, this, is, this was the very beginning of what we call the early steps of biological engineering. So the more recent steps were, of course, transgenic. So we were able to modify, for example, maize in order that um, modern breeds could be resistant to different diseases and to different um, aspects um, of um, production. And um, this happened almost 30 years ago, and it was again uh, one step forward into the emergence of what we call biological or genomic engineering. That's, that, that, that means our ability to transform nature, our ability to transform the species that uh, we know um, today. And just a few years ago, just three, four years ago, four years ago, um, the big revolution, what is called really the discovery of the century, 
um, and that really will promote the merging of biology and of engineering is the discovery of the so-called CRISPR-Cas9 technique or the CRISPR technique. And uh, that was um, a co-discovery uh, by uh, Jennifer Doudna at the University of Berkeley and Emmanuel Charpentier, that was a postdoc unemployed French researcher uh, at the time. They are now pop stars. They will be probably Nobel laureates uh, next year, maybe in two years. Um, but in fact, the ability to have this unique uh, tool will change uh, the biosphere. The possibilities are illimited. We can use, or we will be able to use this technique in many fields. In the environment, for example, helping threatened species to avoid extinction. For example, by controlling invasive species. And we know how much invasion biology is a problem for the health of our ecosystems. We can, for example, um, improve a lot our agriculture by one of those techniques that we now call precision uh, agriculture. We will modify every single gene for each species to increase production, to limit the damages by different uh, uh, bacteria or virus or fungi. So, um, of course, uh, this will have uh, again or also implications in human health, but then it's a totally different field. Um, so this is really the moment um, where biology will become engineering, and this will transform the possibilities and, um, that we have for many, many things. Um, still, and of course, um, this is uh, my very personal view. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm an evolutionary biology. I do genetics, I do genomics, I do a lot of this stuff still. Um, among many hundreds of, of works that I've done, this is my preferred one. This is uh, a field guide of amphibians and reptiles of Portugal. This, is a, it was, this was the first field guide that was done in Portugal for, by Portuguese authors. And that's why, um, and this is why, and this is because what I really love is nature. What I really love are those salamanders. I'm absolutely fascinated by, bio, by the biology of amphibians. And so what I think, and this is uh, um, the second part of, of my talk, is that um, we are losing our sense of the natural world. We are losing our understanding, our knowledge about the natural world, about the species with which we share this planet. We, we know less and less about uh, nature. And because we are far and far from nature, we are more and more in cities, less and less in rural areas. And this is all over the world like this. So we, will, we are in the unique age of genomics. We have unprecedented power to understand biology, to understand nature, to modify nature. And still, we ignore more and more about this. So that was uh, the idea why I um, was, came interested into this um, idea of connecting um, these two worlds. And um, I think the way ahead, um, the key word is enlightenment. We need enlightenment again. We need passion. We need curiosity. And um, what I'm saying this uh, today to you um, is shared by many people all across the world. And for example, uh, this is a nature paper that appear, appeared in May this year. Um, that is a dedication to Sir David Attenborough. Uh, you can recognize uh, uh, say, Sir David Attenborough in, this, in, that, in that photo. Um, and um, that paper that appeared in Nature, it was the commemoration of the 19th birthday of uh, David Attenborough. David Attenborough is one of that unique persons that can transmit, that can communicate with everybody in the world, talking about the fascination of the natural uh, world. And so I really think that what we need at the global level, but of course also in Portugal and also most especially at the University of Porto, is talk about enlightenment, about what we really like in biology, about what we really like uh, in science. And so for example, uh, in this slide, you can see on your right an osprey. The osprey um, was a extinct extinct species in Portugal. And this picture was taken this year 
in the Alqueva Dam in southern Portugal is a new project by Civil reintroducing the species back to Portugal. On your left, you, often, you have almost the same species that, was, that is an illustration by John Audubon. John Audubon is one of the most amazing naturalists and illustrators ever. And that illustration is part of a book that is a symbolic book, all of we know. It's The Birds of America. It's today the most expensive book uh, in the world. It's The Birds of America, and it's um, how um, it shows how the enlightenment John Audubon had about illustrating the beauty of nature. It's remarkable how we can see the parallels between these. That's what I think we need to talk. For example, at the University of Porto, we have been doing um, this, what Novas Viagens Filosóficas, or New Philosophical Voyages, which is a series uh, on Portuguese television that was made for the first time in this country, talking about uh, the different uh, species and different aspects of our world um, today. And, um, of course, um, coming finally to the University of Porto, to the University, to the Faculty of Sciences, to um, the city um, of Porto, um, this new project uh, in which I've been working um, for many years, um, that will be the first part uh, of the new Museum of Natural History and Science at the University of Porto. We, will, we, will call, we are very close to it, just 200 meters from, from it, from this house, uh, which will be very soon the Hall of Biodiversity. And the Hall of Biodiversity will be a, a voyage, will be an understanding, an explanation about the beauty of life, will be an explanation about the exuberance and the aesthetics of life. And this is the very beginning of, of, of the, the, the future exhibition um, that we decided uh, to start with the egg, with the eggs, showing the beauty of eggs that we have all over uh, in the world, uh, coming, of course, from mostly from our birds. The eggs as a, a metaphor for the diversity of life, a, a metaphor for life uh, itself. So we will be using this new hall of biodiversity to explain people, to explain at all levels what life is. And we will transform it, and we will make it especially appealing, making, for example, domestication as art. So this will be one of the other rooms in the hall of biodiversity that will explain people the evolution and the domestication of maize, or how we were able in 6,000 years to transform a very tiny plant that we name Teosint, that still exists today in the plateaus of Mexico, in one of the most important, if not the most important plant that we have today to sustain human populations um, in the planet. And, um, um, of course, um, the main metaphor for the whole project, which is Sofia. Sofia is one of the most important Portuguese poets and writers, um, and the history of the whale of Sofia. The whale of Sofia, uh, which Sofia once predicted um, that would inhabit her own house, it's today there. And it will be just starting uh, on this, uh, that we will try to um, build a new way to communicate uh, with people, to communicate with all sorts of different uh, um, um, people um, the importance of biology um, in this case. And so I would like uh, to end by showing you by showing you, for the first time, a video that will tell you the history of the Whale of Sophia. And um, that uh, resulted in the University of Port and all of us organizing the next um, European Congress of Museums and Science Centers in Porto uh, next June. It all started here, in the ocean, 
almost 4,000 million years ago. Earth was so new and life seemed so urgent, it exploded in a huge variety of forms. Some left the sea for good, and yet some of those who left came back, just like my ancestors. I was born here. Oh, how I love the ocean. I wish you could feel it the way I do. But one day, I really don't know what happened. I just couldn't swim anymore. I tried to come back home, but I couldn't. And there I was, lifeless, laying in Paradise Beach. Isn't it ironic? Thousands of people went there just to see me. They climbed on my back to take pictures. How annoying! A businessman bought my body for a penny. They took my oil to make margarine and soap, and my skeleton was given to the Zoology Institute. I was in a box for almost four years, my bones scattered and mismatched. It was not comfortable at all, but uh, at least they wrote an article about me. They called me Balinoptera musculus, but I prefer blue whale, blue, like the ocean. And then, one day, I was taken out of the box. I could sense what a big day that was. They put me right in the center of the most important room at the Natural History Museum. The room of the general collection. There were all kinds of animals there, so different, yet so similar to me. Lots of people went there to visit us. But then, after a while, I started to feel this terrible pain in my back. That stiff, upright position was so uncomfortable. What were they thinking? One day, a very special person paid me a visit. She was a beautiful woman with sensitive eyes. Her name was Sophia, a great poet, you know. Are you in pain? she asked me. A little bit, yes. I wish I could help you. I wish I could take you swimming again. I wish you could, Sophia. I wish you could.
Her grandfather was a Danish sailor. He saw many whales like me before. Sophia wrote about him in one of her books, History of Land and Sea. She wished I would live in her grandfather's house. It is as big as the ocean, she told me. But Sophia never came back, and I waited for thirty years, thirty long years. And then they closed the museum. No visitors anymore. I was scared at first, but at least I could stretch my back. One day, people I've never seen before came and started looking at me, and all of a sudden they began pulling me apart. Bone by bone, I was gently freed from my narrow harness. In some faraway land, I was nurtured, all clean, sanitized, analyzed. They even took my DNA for testing. Then they put me in a truck. I don't know how long the journey took. It was so dark there was nothing I could see. But when they opened the door, I realized I was at Sophia's grandfather's house. Nothing shorter than Sophia had described. A huge space, like the ocean. The Anderson don't live here anymore. It is now the new hall of biodiversity. They assembled me piece by piece. But I didn't feel stiff anymore. I was diving. I was swimming. I could swim again. People keep visiting me every day, and I tell them, as long as there are whales in the ocean, there is hope. I wish you will visit me one day as well. I will tell you stories about my life. Perhaps you will also have stories of your own. I'd love to listen to them, stories about lives. Life everywhere, in the ocean, in the continents, in poetry, in museums, in our memories, in people's thoughts and decisions, in people's actions. Will you visit me next year? Thank you very much. It's really great to be here. Uh, I'm very grateful to the, for the invitation. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm also happy for speaking uh, after my good friend, Nun Ferrand. I wish you the best with the whale and this project. Um, uh, strangers and brothers revisiting the two cultures. On 7th May 1959, the English, play, the English physicist and chemist, novelist, politician, and public intellectual Charles Percy Snow, better known as C.P. Snow, delivered a famous lecture at the University of Cambridge as part of the Reed Lectures. It was entitled The Two Cultures, The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution, indeed. This became famous. The book, which contains the text of this lecture, has been published, reprinted, translated, and criticized all over the world. In Portugal, the first edition of this book 
who was issued by Don Quixote in 1965. It was one of the first books published by this uh, um, Don Quixote. This is, it was a new company founded by Snow because he's a Danish woman who came to Portugal. She was 25 at that time. And now the, the, the publisher is more than uh, 50. And so she brought uh, ideas from the art side. And this was at the time an important idea, the, the question of the two cultures. Um, yeah, I think it's good to, this is the Portuguese edition, first edition. Um, it's a, a, a bit lengthy, but I think it's important to, to bring uh, this, the text, the original text of C.P. Snow. Um, he was criticizing, this, uh, he, he started by criticizing the scientists, he, he started to be a scientist, so he knew about. Uh, but then he, he, he criticized the literary people, the so-called intellectuals. They are impoverished too, perhaps more seriously, because they are vulnerable about it. They still like to pretend that the traditional culture is the whole of culture, as what the natural order didn't exist as what the exploration of the natural order was of no interest either in its own value or its consequences, as what the scientific edifice of the physical world was not in its intellectual depth, complexity, and articulation the most beautiful and wonderful collective work of the mind of man. The most beautiful and wonderful collective work of, of the mind of man. Yet most non-scientists have no conception of that edifice at all. Even if they want to have it, they can't. It is rather as thought over an immense range of intellectual experience, the whole group was tone deaf. Except that this tone deafness doesn't come by nature. It's what, it is not like the, these animals. But by training, or rather by the absence of training. <laughs> I think this is still, today it's still important to remember this. And then comes the famous invective against men of letters with regard to the second law of thermodynamics, law of entropy. And since the director is a uh, chemical engineer, I think you'd like to, <laughs> to hear this. As with the tone deaf, they don't know what they miss. They give a pitying chuckle at the news of scientists who have never read a major work of English literature. They dismiss them as ignorant specialists. Yet their own ignorance and their own specialization is just, a start, as, is just as startling. A good many times I have present, at, I've been present at gatherings of people who, by the standards of traditional culture, are thought highly educated and who have, with considerable gusto, been expressing their incredulity at the illiteracy of scientists. Once or twice, I have them provoked and they have asked the company how many of them could describe the second law of thermodynamics. The response was cold. It was also negative. Yet I was asking something which is about the scientific equivalent of, have you ever read a work by, of Shakespeare? I now believe that if I had asked an even simple question, such as, what do you mean by mass or acceleration? or which is the equivalent, the scientific equivalent of saying, can you read? Uh, not more than one in 10 of the highly educated would have felt that I was speaking the same language. So the great edifice of modern physics goes up and the majority of the cleverest people in the Western world have about as much insight into it as their Neolithic ancestor would have had. This is strong. <laughs> Okay, end of quotation. Um, as the issue was very pertinent and this style had the liveness required to bring it to readers' attention, it was no surprise that rivers of ink flowed in response to it. In a text published four years later, The Two Cultures and a Second Look, C.P. Snow backpedaled in relation to his previous position and um, he was emphasizing the separation between the two cultures in the first text. And then he spoke about the possibility of the reconciliation in what might be called the third culture. By analyzing the controversy caused by, by his original article, 
lecture, he noted, however, that he, that he was not alone and was not even the first to say what he had said. So you are complaining about my speech, but there are other people. I am not alone. And one of them was the Polish-British mathematician, uh, a Jew, uh, Jakob Bronowski, uh, who, like Snow, made a career in the British civil service and also, like him, achieved a prominent position in public life as an intellectual uh, voice. Bronowski, perhaps even to a great extent than Snow, was one of the rare polymaths of modern times. He was a science historian, a science popularizer. He is the author of the acclaimed television series, The Essence of Man, broadcast by the BBC, um, and, sub uh, and subsequently published in book form. He was poet, he was playwright, and he was literary critic, so he was everything. In fact, Bronowski published three articles in 1959 in the University's Quarterly, associated with three lectures he had given at MIT in 1953. They were combined to make the essay Science and Human Values, published in Portuguese again later, much later, by Don Quixote. Uh, Bronowski illustrated his leitmotiv, the unity of culture, not with the work of uh, uh, Shakespeare, as Snow had done, but with the definition by the English romantic poet and critic Samuel Coleridge. Uh, Coleridge, in 1814, in his book On the Principles of General Criticism Concerning Fine Arts, he wrote, the most general definition of beauty Therefore is, that I may fulfill my threat of plaguing my readers with hard words, multiti in unity. Multiti is, is a new word. Multiti in unity. Bronowski taking Coleridge's concept said. When Coleridge tried to define beauty, he returned always to one deep thought. Beauty, he said, is unity in verity. Science is nothing else than the search to discover unity in the wild variety of nature. We have seen that with biology. We see that very well in biology. Or more exactly, in the variety of our experience of nature. Poetry, painting, the arts are the same search in Coleridge's phrase for unity in verity. Each in its own way looks at for likeness under the variety of human experience. What is a poetic image but the seizing and exploration of a hidden likeness in holding together two parts of a comparison which are to give more depth each to the other. So while Snow, in his polemic article, Veld Science, which in his view was insufficient, insufficiently appreciated by the public in comparison with art, Bronowski drew attention to the essential unity which exists between science and art. For him, there were not two cultures, but only one. So we, don't, we were not in need of a third culture. We only need to define culture in, in an in a adequate way. The content for science in some circles had, after all, no justification and was merely the result of tradition and prejudice, perhaps perpetuated by a stagnant education system. I think I have to emphasize that, by a stagnant education system. Later, in the same essay, Bronowski wrote in defense of the deep cultural unity he uncovered between science and art. And another question, quotation by, by Bronowski. The discoveries of science, the works of art, are explorations, more, are explosions of a hidden likeness. The discoverer or the artist pre presents in them two aspects of nature and fuses them into one. This is the act of creation. By the way, poetry means creation. In which the original thought in, in, is born and it is the same act in original science or original art. It is interesting uh, that in the post snow era, the mathematician Bronowski found it appropriate to make an apology for poetry rather than making one for science. In an interview published in The American Scholar in 1974, Bronowski said the following about poetry. Now defending poetry, a mathematician defending poetry. Poetry is a wonderful theme that we should consider 
whenever we talk about scientific ideas, because it reminds us that one can communicate the truth of undoubted intellectual value without the need to be complemented by any system of equations. So it is a mathematician who is saying that. The difference between science and art will therefore be more than one of language and of content. While the language of science was mathematical, and Galileo has said that, uh, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, and the characters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures. Um, poetry is expressed through uh, words in, a, in a, let's say, a more easy language than mathematics, but not without rules. But if science and art collude in their attempt to grasp the unity of the world and are only separated by the use of different languages, when seemingly more intelligible by, uh, since it is primarily addressing the emotions, um, could there be some parallels regarding their methodology? In the same interview, Bronowski added that both poetry and science depend on the human capacity to imagine that is, of our, end quotation, quote, of our ability to retain images in the mind, to identify this image with constituent elements of reality, and reorganize these elements into imaginary situations. And he added that, so that there remain no doubts about, uh, after, uh, about the conclusion, that he wanted to convey the following, quote again, all of our intellectual activities depend on these projections, both in science and poetry. So the methodology is the use of imagination, creation of images. In fact, imagination is the ultimate resource, both of science and art. The Swiss-American, German-born physicist Albert Einstein, when asked by a journalist in 1929 to choose between knowledge and imagination, um, he said without uh, um, hesitation. He replied without hesitation. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited, but imagination embrace, embraces the entire world. A friend of Einstein recalled later a similar phrase that he heard. When I examined myself and my methods of thought, I came to the conclusion that the gift of fantasy here meant more to me, has meant more to me than my talent for absorbing uh, knowledge itself. In this context, I would like to introduce a Portuguese author, less known than uh, C.P. Stowe or Bronowski, of course, of Einstein, <laughs> the mathematician and geographical engineer Antonio Lobo Vilela. Um, he, he is the, 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 by the way, he was, he was educated here at the University of Oporto. Uh, he made the course here. Um, and later he found no job. <laughs> uh, he was in 1955, so at the same time as, as C.P. Snow, more or less the same time as C.P. Snow and, uh, and uh, Bronowski, so end of the 50s. Um, he, he wrote this book. Uh, I have here the, the book Ciencia e Poesia, Science and Poetry. Um, and he was saying in this book, the, just starting, just to start, that the conviction long ago took root in my mind that there are close affinities between scholars and poets contrary to common opinion. Um, he, he was a mathematician like Bronowski, um, and he was politically engaged, so he was an opposer to the so-called New State Estado Novo, the regime of Salazar at that time. Um, and this book resulted from a lecture he gave in Lisbon. Um, and this, this lecture, I think, is very rich because he brings examples from Portuguese literature, not uh, invoking Shakespeare or college, but bringing Portuguese authors. Um, for instance, Fernando Pessoa, uh, also, he has, a, a, as you know, lots of different names, more than 100 names. And one of the most famous names of Fernando Pessoa is Albert Camps. He was an engineer, by the way, a naval engineer, a f uh, a formed educated in Glasgow. Fernando Pessoa wrote, this is a small poem, only two lines. Newton's binomial is as beautiful as the Venus of Milo. But there are but few people who know this. 
so for the benefit of you who cannot compare, <laughs> <laughs> you have here, so you may now guess with which is which, so the Venus and the Newton's binomial. Uh, going further back in time, he quotes the poet, writer, journalist, and politician Guerra Junqueira, Portuguese, uh, who wrote the following, and, and this is astonishing, it was astonishing for me to, to read this, that Guerra Junqueira said the following, poetry is truth transformed into feeling. The law discovered by Newton can be explained in a physics book and sank from a book, and sank from a book of verse, a poet, a verse. The wise man looks at it, demonstrates it, and the poet, starting from this demonstration, draws from the facts all the moral, social, and religious consequences, translating them in an emotional way. In this case, science gives us conviction, certainty. Poetry gives us emotion, enthusiasm. He then cites the, the, another Portuguese writer, the poet and writer, uh, Antero de Quintal, a contemporary of Junqueiro, uh, and in a letter wrote to a friend, uh, end of the 19th century, he, 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 he said the following. The ground on which today's certainty rests are, was formed by successive waves of ancient intuition. What no is science was once poetry. The sage was once a singer, the legislator a poet, and the evidence a riddle, a brave guess, whose profound conclusions are amazement, perhaps despair of the strictest philosophies. And if today you bath in the full right of reason, it was poetry, that gentle hand which guided us through the pale twilight of ancient dreams. Ancient, no, eternal dreams. So, since Portuguese isolation was notorious in the 50s, it is remarkable that at the same time that Bronowski and Snow were placing the issue of the unity of, of culture in the cultural agenda, a Portuguese wrote on the same topic, saying uh, almost the same and quoting Portuguese authors of so I can tell instead of Shakespeare and Coleridge. But Salazar Portugal was arid soil for the growth of culture dialogue. Lobo Vilela was just one of several intellectuals banned by the regime, and this university uh, was suffering from that. Um, Abel Salazar, for instance, Rui Luis Gomes, and that. Uh, preventing, uh, so the regime, the political regime prevented him from being a teacher, uh, 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 professor and he became a teacher in high school and was for, he was even prevented from being a teacher in high school and he was forced to leave from translations and to give and from private lessons. Um, but um, it is astonishing, at least for me, that he was so well acquainted with the, with the literature and he was a mathematician, a mathematician and with the, the question, uh, the question of the two cultures. <coughs> Later on, um, a, a teacher with a degree in physics and chemistry also here at the University of Oporto, Romuald Carvalho, um, which is uh, na also known under a pseudonym, Antonio Gideon, found an original way to bring science and poetry together. So he wrote poems inspired by science. Um, um, in Portugal, these poems are well known. Uh, but they deserve to be more known abroad. If he had published in, in English, he could have been uh, now world famous, but he isn't. Uh, I have a special relationship with Rommel because I, uh, he, he was also doing outreach, uh, writing books for young people. Science for Young People was the title of a collection. And I went to physics, I have to confess, due to these books I was reading as a teenager. Um, so, in order to pay, this is a book uh, which appeared in the, here in the university about Rommel in Oporto. Uh, uh, in order to pay homage to Rommel de Carvalho, I, I found a, a library uh, specialized on scientific culture in my university, in the University of Greece. And this library is growing. It's, uh, I, I see uh, the, the growing of the, the evolution, also growing and evolution of this library. This library uh, is growing under the umbrella of Ciencia Viva, the, the idea, the movement founded or established by Zé Marian Gago. And I remember on this occasion, uh, Zé Marian Gago is no longer with us, but uh, um, you know that you were, you were, you were at his death, you were uh, 
being collecting outside just yeah it is was it is this was rather uncommon but it was not only here so all scientists and teachers were were all over Portugal so so what what happened after that um, um, so there is um, we have still a problem with the two culture I, I'm afraid to say that uh, um, the, um, we don't recognize yet that uh, science and arts, they all belong to the framework of the vast and rich human culture. I say human culture because the animals, they have also cultures. They can use tools, they can communicate. So human culture. Um, it is interesting to point out that the two referred Portuguese authors from here at this university played their cultural roles out completely outside the university. And this is a challenge for today. Today, a challenge for the university is precisely a better integration of the two cultures inside in the academia. Trans uh, and this fusion could have transforming effects in the outside world. In fact, I am afraid that the two cultures are separated inside the university. And this is a problem, of course. Um, if, they are, uh, if there is a gap here, the gap is also outside the university. So the university is not adequately fulfilling its cultural role. Um, in the 90s, um, there was a discussion about the third culture. And this book appeared by John Brockman, and in this book, uh, it, it was collecting uh, articles by many scientists, uh, like, for instance, uh, Stephen Jay Gold, uh, Richard Dawkins, and other people from Oxford, and other, other scientists. And uh, this publisher, John Brockman, he was saying that the new intellectuals are the scientists. I will not say that. I don't think that the, that the scientists have some superiority. I think this is a, just a, a bad thing, a bad phrase to, to, start, uh, to start or to continue the dialogue. But uh, of course we know that people, they like to hear what the scientists say. And this collection by Gladiva Ciencia Aberta shows there is people interested in science. So there's people listening to the scientists. The, the history of... Uh, uh, I, I, I would like to I make you a shortcut, and I'd like to, I would like to, to recommend a book, uh, this book uh, called Newton's Binomial and the Venus of Milo. Now you understand the title. <laughs> it's uh, Poetry and Science in Portuguese Literature, and it was done by Vasco Graça Moura. And you know Vasco Graça Moura because you have his library at the Faculty of Humanities. Um, and uh, Maria Bocicio. Uh, so this book, I think, uh, is very enriching because it says that in the Portuguese literature, the presence of science is huge. Going back to Gil Vicente and Camões, through Fernando Pessoa to nowadays. And there are scientists who have written literature and there are literates who try to learn science. So there is an history on this subject. So when we talk about the future, we should know the past. Uh, here in Oporto, I will also like to remind the role of Paul Cunha Silva, because um, he was trying, sometimes inside the university, sometimes outside the university, he was trying to bring together art and science. And bringing together art and science is a part, maybe the, a key part of the project led by Nuno Ferran, and with a strong support by the director, the, the Museum of Natural History and Science here in Oporto. So this is a strong idea. A powerful way to attract citizens to science is to explore emotions, to explore the enthusiasm that, that can be raised in people through pieces of art. To conclude, to conclude, I'd like to express my strong agreement with Bronowski, Lobo Vilela, and, uh, and others, of course. In my opinion, to talk about two or even three cultures is too complicated and already complex issue. So we don't need to think about a third or fourth culture. 
uh, we don't need to, to abandon the artistic or scientific culture. They exist. They grew separately. But in the past, they, have, they had that frequent contacts leading to always to mutual enrichment. And now we, we have to, what we have to do is to find more bridges between the two so that at some point uh, it is clear that they are united. This is maybe the idea, I like the word of consilience by Edward Wilson, a biologist. Consilience, bringing the things together. The, the physicist, Erwin Schrodinger, point out that in, in lectures give, he gave in London and Dublin in, in the 50s, uh, and included in this book, Nature and the Greeks are, and Science and Humanism. There are two lectures together. That's why we have these two titles, Nature and the Greeks, one, and Science and Humanism. Um, and he said that the science are intended to satisfy the human need for self-knowledge. So are the arts as well. For in the ultimate concern of man, was and will always we be who to respond to the question who are us, and this is already reflected in the inscription on the Temple of Delphi in in Greece. Know yourself. The men of arts, the men of arts, and the men of science are one and the same. There is only one culture, human culture, which has several facets, of course. Uh, these two, and maybe others, religion is another facet. Um, the idea that science is outside culture seems to me not only false, but also pernicious. Science, the human capacity to respond using a defined method to questions raised by nature, and we are included in nature, nature of course, is one of the greatest achievements of the human spirit. Perhaps the best title for an approach of the two cultures would be that of a series of novels of C.P. Snow. He started as a scientist and then he became a novelist. And he has a series of books called Strangers and Brothers. The literary and scientific culture may be strangers, and now I use this metaphor. The literary and scientific culture may be strangers to each other, but they are irrefutably brothers. Or in Portuguese, we say they are feminine, called uh, art, ciencia, a art, a ciencia. They are feminine, so they are not brothers, they are sisters. Thank you very much. <laughs> So thank you so much for these two interesting talks. And uh, we are going to pass to the comments to our colleagues. And uh, first of all, André Lamasleit is prof professor in the Faculty of Law. And um, I understand his main area of expertise is criminology and penal law. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I look a very interesting thing also in his curriculum that uh, he mentioned the cultural life, that is uh, something that we, we some, sometimes we, we, we didn't uh, saw in, in the curriculum of academic people. Uh, so I understand he is an artist also because <laughs> he, he have books of poetry and so it's interesting to hear what uh, he, he have to say today. And uh, also João Pedro Xavier is a professor of architecture in, at the University of Porto and um, um, member of the Center of Studies in Architecture and uh, Urbanism. And uh, I understand his main area is the perspective that is quite interesting also to, to bring us uh, some perspective of this talk. So, this talk. So, um, please, we are going to start with Andre. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to to welcome you, and of course, I'd like to give my thanks, my special thanks to the Deputy Rector, Vice Rector, Professor uh, Pedro Teixeira, and also to our Rector, Professor Sebastião Feira Azevedo, for the invitation to be here with you. Of course, as a professor of the Faculty of Law here, among all these scientists, uh, is a bit awkward. One, one, could, one, could, one could start by asking that. 
But I must tell you that um, without knowing the contents, of course, of the conferences of the uh, very well-known professors, uh, I would say that uh, my comments will be, will be kind of a cold blood comment uh, because, of course, I didn't have the time and there are so many issues that uh, are raised by these two uh, conferences that, in fact, we could be here a lot of time, but, of course, we don't uh, have that time and it's always very dangerous to give words to, uh, to some, uh, some guy from the law because normally we talk a lot and we don't say many things, but we normally talk a lot of time. So, but from, from what uh, I would like to, to, to talk to you and to, to comment, uh, some comments on, uh, on the two presentations, I would probably focus more on the first one because it's more uh, connected with my field of knowledge. Um, we all know that in criminology, um, crime, and I would say deviance, using the French word, which is mm, more broader than crime itself, we are always looking to uh, see if there is anything different uh, in the criminal. Uh, and that's the history of criminology, going back to Lombroso, going back to Garofalo, going back to the biological, uh, to the doctors who started criminology back in the 18th and 19th century. So they started to think that uh, criminals had skulls different from normal people. They started then saying that probably, and that was the cause of crime. Uh, then we changed to some kind of psychological and sociological approach. And then we tried to say, well, this, this man or this woman is a criminal because he or she had a very bad environment. He or she had a very good or bad upbringing. And then uh, in, our, in the past century, after this uh, bio cycle, psychological and sociolog sociological approach, of course that we also had the input of genetics. And we all know that uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, in criminology, there were a lot of studies trying to define which was a gene that was responsible for crime. And many geneticists were studying that. And they were trying to tell us that when they were able to identify it, that would be also very important. Because if we see from the history of criminology and from the history of criminal law, we are always looking at a criminal as someone that is different from us. And that's, of course, the very wrong perspective. A criminal is someone just like us, just like all of us who is uh, at his room uh, right now. But uh, that is also uh, continued nowadays with neuroscience. There is also a field of knowledge, especially in the, in the United States, that is nowadays called neuro law or neuro jurisprudence. We know that from tomographies and from other uh, from, uh, from uh, brain scans that uh, many scientists are trying to tell us that the fact that someone is a criminal is um, due to the fact that there is some kind of malfunction in his or her brain. And this is bringing to us, scholars from criminal law, a lot of questions. Because criminal law is based in what we call the blame. We have to convict someone because we can blame him. We can say that he or she could act differently from the way he or she did. But if neuroscientists come and tell us that this is, also, this is all very deterministic, that someone has to behave this way because he or she has some kind of pathology in his brain, well, where does criminal law go? I would lose my job if uh, they are right because all the construction, all the dogmatic construction that we made around the concept of offense would in fact disappear. And something that also puzzled me from the first intervention is that we are facing uh, these days, uh, what, uh, what uh, German scholars uh, say, Rechtsfreiraum, this means that, in fact, we, are not, we, ha we have no longer any space, or uh, at least a few space, is not governed by law. If we think on what we eat, we are discussing that outside. If we think on what we see, if we think on whom we talk to, and the wiretapping, 
that we all are, we can also, uh, we can all be uh, be wiretapped illegally or legally. Uh, if we think about that, there is in fact few space in our life, even uh, without the law. Even if, when we go to our home, and of course we all know the, the English expression, my house is my castle, it's no longer our castle. It's no longer our castle because everything is governed, in fact, by law, the way the houses are built, the way they are constructed. So that thing is also very, very puzzling. And for us uh, in law that are normally defenders of the civil liberties, of the civil guarantees, uh, that is also, in fact, uh, very, very puzzling. And uh, th th that there, was a, there was an expression in the second, uh, in the second conference by Professor Carlos Fugliais, uh, who was quoting Antero de Quintal. And the, uh, to a certain point he said that the, legis the legislator or the lawmaker as a poet. Well, I wish he was a poet because, <laughs> in <laughs> fact, what we see is that, uh, well, at least in Portugal, we have this very bad habit of legislating all over. For example, the criminal code that uh, should be something that is not uh, easily uh, reviewed, is not easily amended. We, our criminal code is from 1982, and it has been 40 times amended. 40 times. Hmm? You can imagine that. So, uh, in fact, the way we think, and I, even when I was a student here at the University of Porto and being a professor for 16 years here at the same university, I think that the way we think in, uh, in law is very similar to the way mathematicians think. We use a lot of logical concepts. In our argumentative speech, we begin with a general idea. We have, to, we have the facts, and then we have to submit those facts to the reality, to the legal reality we have, especially in criminal law. You have to identify the facts and then you have to see whether these facts are not applicable to a certain criminal offense. So there is in fact a lot of communication between law and other sciences. Well, many, of, of the pe many people say that law is not a science. Well, for me, I would say to you that I don't consider law as a science. I rather consider it as an art. And this, is not, and this is not less being an art than being a science, uh, because it's the art of persuasion. It's the art of building what we think is, best, is the best for our community. This is the utmost important. This is of the utmost important. And in fact, I would say that being, well, a very modest poet, uh, that's true. When, when uh, Professor Carlos Fugliais was telling that um, being a poet has a lot to do with being, uh, with being uh, a scientist. If we go back to uh, surrealism or to uh, neorealism, and if we remember visual poetry, that's in fact, uh, that has got a lot to do with equations, with, math with mathematics. So in fact, poetry, as the way I think it is, it is in fact that we start with facts. And we have that ability to imagine. And that ability to imagine once was something uh, from the uh, kind of an utopia by Thomas More. And nowadays it's reality. So I would say that I totally agree with Professor Carlos Fugliais uh, that culture is only one. What we need is in fact to, um, to have that uh, spirit of interdisciplinarity. We were also discussing outside, well, Normally, everything that is important in Congress stays outside from the, from the chats that we have in the corridors. And in fact, it's, it's, very, it's very sad, I must say, and it's not a problem also only at the University of Porto. I think that it's a problem all over the world, that we don't know what we are doing each other. And um, we don't know what the, what the well, those, those very dull guys, those very, uh, sometimes very annoying guys from the Faculty of Law uh, are doing. And we have a lot in common. Uh, and we can, and I think that is the, the future of the university and connecting it with what we call the third mission. We can't have a third mission if we don't know each other if we don't know what we are working in. 
and we don't if we don't uh, if we don't uh, try to um, to use our synergies among the university and I would th I would say that these two conferences uh, are a kind of uh, um, an advice for for us and a kind of reminding us of this importance of this importance to start at home what we want to do in the world. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. First, I would like to thank our rector and our vice rector, Pedro Teixeira, uh, for the invitation to take part in this uh, panel with these prominent scientists and educators. Uh, and educators, professors Nuno Ferran and uh, Carlos Fulais, together with my colleague, colleagues um, André Lemas Leite uh, and uh, Carla uh, as moderator. Uh, I'm supposed to, to comment their, their talks, which is a very difficult task, uh, mainly after the, the pertinent comments of my colleague André. So, um, let's say if I can say anything useful for the debate. So, I will start trying to find some connections between the two talks, um, and then I will concentrate, concentrate more directly uh, in uh, Carlos, Professor Carlos Fulhais' presentation, because, just because it touches areas to which I'm more acquainted to, although, a little bit surprised, I, I, I have to confess with the very beautiful, beautiful presentation um, from Nuno Ferrin. Uh, uh, after all, <laughs> he, he deals also with an area that I'm very uh, uh, fond to, with, which is the, the way you, you, you combine art and science in order to show this in a very beautiful way to the public. And I uh, would like to say that the video, just the video, not all the things are, seems to me very beautiful, but the video was just marvelous. Congratulations, it's a magnificent, <laughs> magnificent work. Um, so, um, I found in both talks, at least, um, the same concern about human being, uh, synthesized either in the big questions posed in, uh, by Ferrin uh, in, it, in the title, where do you come from, what are we, where are we going, or in uh, Schrodinger's uh, thoughts quoted by Carlos Fulhais, uh, to whom the ultimate concert of man is, uh, was and always will be, who are, who, who are we? So, uh, in Ferran's talk, we learned that with the advance of genetics, we are able to know much more about ourselves. And he didn't go into this, um, this field, but this poses a lot of questions, um, uh, ethical and social-political questions um, that must be uh, 